Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Lali Ahmed, and I am one of your three Athenaeum fellows for this year. Of those diagnosed with breast cancer, it is much more likely to be fatal for African American women than for white women. Hispanic and African American patients are more likely to die from diabetes than white patients. The wait for African American patients needing a kidney transplant is almost twice as long as the wait for white patients. Women are 73% more likely to be injured in a car accident than men. When heart attacks do occur, fewer women than men are likely to survive the first attack. When seeking care, it cannot be presumed that the treatment has been tested and shown to be effective on someone like you. Most study participants are white or men or both, and as a result, we live in a world that was not designed for women or other racial groups. This is also true of mental health care and child care. Our speaker tonight, Professor Lau, our speaker tonight, Professor Lau, is a child clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at University of California, Los Angeles. She is a psychologist and she has had training in children's mental health services research and the study of racial and ethnic disparities and access and utilization of care among youth. Her research spans the area of disparities in child's mental health services, cultural variation in risk and protective factors for child psychopathology, and community implementation of evidence-based practices. Lau's work on risk and protective factors for youth in immigrant families has guided her research with Asian American and Latinx children. Another major research effort involves, involves understanding factors that promote the use of evidence-based practices by therapists in community and mental health clinics in Los Angeles County. And now, as always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time, and please join me in welcoming Professor Lau to the Athenaeum. Thank you, Lau. Thank you. So that was the best introduction anyone has ever made for me. I'm so, so impressed. Thank you, Lale. Um, and thank you, everyone uh, who invited me out here uh, to give this talk at the ATH. I really still can't believe this is a thing. This is so um, such an amazing uh, resource and uh, event for people. I want to thank Professor Weichen Huang um, and Priya Junar, who um, uh, offered to host me for this talk, so it's a really a pleasure to be here. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is, um, like Lale introduced, translating evidence into practice uh, in the context of mental health treatment for ethnic minority um, youth and families. Okay, so um, these are the kind of, I know that the ATH is usually of these really fantastically interesting people who have these amazing life stories and probably, um, you know, we're just these very inspiring, personally exciting people. So I might not be giving that kind of talk today. <laughs> I was like, how am I going to do this? Because I'm just usually so professorial and talking about research. So that's what you are going to get today. You're going to mostly get a research talk. Um, and, uh, but, but I am going to try to bring this to other social issues like um, Lale did as well. So I'm going to be talking about what evidence-based practice in mental health is. Um, defining what we mean by the research to practice gap in mental health um, and you know how people have tried to approach the challenge of adapting evidence-based practices um, for populations who they weren't originally developed for um, and uh, I want to end with really thinking about what practice-based evidence is and what we can really learn from people who are working on the front lines of mental health about how to provide the best care to diverse families. So what do we mean uh, when we say evidence-based practice? So there's going to be multiple definitions of this that you can find in the field that differentially weight how much research data from experiments should go into this and how much we should consider patient preferences and how much we should consider things like um, provider competence. But for the purposes of today's talk, when I say evidence-based practices, I'm really going to be talking about treatments that have been studied um, in uh, clinical trials um, that show a treatment to be effective in reducing a particular mental health problem. 
And if we think about what are the types of evidence um, that people look at to determine whether something can be called evidence-based, the gold standard is really the randomized control trial. So this is really where we, the, uh, the researcher randomly assigns patients to, to receive an, a particular treatment, a well-specified treatment, versus some sort of control condition. And that randomization is really important, right? Because then if we see differences across the conditions, we can say it's not about the people who just so happen to get one treatment versus the other. We're randomizing it. And that's really uh, the crux of the uh, scientific method. There are other types of evidence that people consider that may make something evidence-based. So cohort studies where we just observe a group of patients that get one kind of treatment versus the other, but we haven't randomized them. That would be considered less rigorous. All the way down through um, case studies or uh, expert opinion, which would be really a lower tier of evidence. And today I'm primarily going to be talking about treatments that have emerged from these randomized controlled trials that are considered to have the best evidence of effectiveness. And so what do people in the general population know about evidence-based practice? Well, this is um, an important question for a number of reasons. Um, and this is a study by a colleague of mine, Mandy Jensen Doss, that she conducted with her uh, students at the University of Miami, where she really wanted to assess what is the general population's understanding of what evidence-based mental health care is. And um, so they carried out this study, and their hypothesis was that most people weren't aren't going to be able to give you that definition of evidence-based practice about um, it is uh, interventions or treatments that have been shown. Uh, through scientific studies to be effective. And that's uh, indeed what she found in her general population sample. Only about one in five U.S. adults in that study could define evidence-based mental health care, even though m most everybody in the sample said that they really value scientific information when making healthcare decisions. And we don't have really good data on this, but I would really bet that um, the understanding of evidence-based mental health treatment differs a little bit from what people think about medical treatment. So you, the average patient who's uh, going to a physician for a medical procedure or a medicine, they might really want to know, has there been a trial of this medication to show that it works for my problem? Or what are the chances of five-year survival rates for this medical procedure? People kind of understand that there's an evidence base for medicine. When it comes to mental health treatment, people have very different ideas about what psychotherapy might look like, and they think about, well, what have I seen in the movies, um, and uh, this sort of thing. And it's a little bit, there's a little bit less of an understanding that you really might want to seek out a treatment that has been shown uh, to be effective for your problem. So um, there are a number of efforts that have been made to try to impart information to the general public about effective care for particular problems. This is a website that's um, put out by the Society for, uh, of Clinical and Child and Adolescent Psychology. And what this is trying to do is to get into the hands of consumers information about what kinds of treatments are effective for child emotional and behavior problems. Um, and what this is trying to do is it's trying to generate pull for evidence-based care, meaning consumer demand for evidence-based care. And so mental health treatment and uh, behavioral interventions don't really have the same kind of consumer-directed marketing and uh, direct-to-consumer marketing like pharmaceuticals do. You, you might, if you watch television, broadcast television, you probably know about some treatments that have been shown to you know, reduce acne maybe, or <laughs> other things that are pharmaceuticals, um, but we don't have a similar way of, uh, a really well disseminated way of trying to get consumers to think about um, the types of mental health behavioral treatments they're getting. So some folks are trying to work on generating more pull for effective treatments. On the treatment development side, we're at the point in children's mental health 
where we've had you know, the last 40 to 50 years of people developing um, evidence, these evidence-based treatments. We have, at latest count, really up to 600 different treatments that have been shown to be effective for reducing children's emotional and behavioral problems. And we can sort of further classify them into about 90 different sort of families of treatment um, that people you know, might uh, consider, if they knew about them, might be able to say, okay, well, you know, my child is having disruptive behavior problems. I know that what could be effective for them are these different uh, families of treatments. Um, so we have lots and lots of treatments. They're codified in very detailed protocols and manuals. And where do they live? They kind of live in offices like mine, in universities, manuals um, about evidence-based care for children. But who really actually knows about these in practice settings? So this is where we're starting to talk about the research to practice gap in children's mental health and in mental health broadly. So who is is providing evidence-based practice to children and families, and who is getting evidence-based practice um, is a big question that we ask about in terms of this research to practice gap. So some of you might have heard of this kind of statistic that the Institute of Medicine first started put, to put out, and it's kind of sometimes described as the implementation cliff. And what this means is that on average, it seems to take about 17 years for about 14% of research evidence to make its way into affecting clinical practice in routine care settings. So it takes a really long time and only a little bit of the research um, evidence actually influences the care that people get into the community. Um, and this is a slide from Dr. David Chambers, who's an, uh, what we call an implementation scientist, who is a real leader at the National Cancer Institute. He writes a lot about um, this implementation cliff. So why only 14% of research evidence, and why does it take so long, 17 years? I'm not going to go into too much detail, except to say that people do a whole bunch of research, okay, and then, you know, researchers sometimes submit their results of the research, not all the time, but sometimes submit that for publication. And then of the research that's submitted for dissemination, only some of it is accepted and, and published in uh, research uh, journals and articles. Okay, And then further, so now you've published your data, great. So you're a university professor who studies mental health treatment. You've published the research. Well, who's going to read it? Um, well, you'll have an increased chance if someone has indexed that study and uh, made it easy for other people to find. So that's this bibliographic data sets. And then even better, it might even uh, further get much closer to influencing practice if some has, someone like the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, or some other body or entity has said, let's put this into practice guidelines that people are going to learn about when they're in medical school, for example, or when they're in psychology graduate school. So it ends up in educational materials. It ends up in guidelines for paying for care um, with insurance companies. And then it's, once it gets there, then it's much more likely that that practice is going to affect the care that you get in the community. So lots of reasons why we only get down to 14% and lots of reasons why it takes on average 17 years. So implementation science is a new burgeoning field um, at, that really studies um, what are the methods and strategies for increasing the flow of research evidence into affecting care that people receive in communities. So it's um, trying to uh, understand what promotes the uptake of interventions that we know are effective in routine care to affect uh, ultimately improve population health. So I'll just tell a little historical story about um, uh, implementation. Um, so this is the story, um, this is 1846, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis um, was a physician scientist, Hungarian physician scientist, and uh, this was before germ theory. This was before Louis Pasteur's work, 
okay? And he was really interested in solving this problem of um, on the maternity wards in the hospital in which he worked, women were dying at high rates of what they called at the time childbed fever, okay? Um, and one thing he observed was that uh, the rates of death were much higher. There were two wards, two maternity wards, one staffed by physicians and another staffed by midwives. And what he noticed was that the death rates were five times higher in those wards staffed by uh, physicians, okay? He started to uh, really think that there was something important about that difference. Um, and that, uh, okay, this is, okay, here we go. So um, one thing he learned was that uh, one physician who was a pathologist succumbed to a fever and died after conducting an autopsy on a woman who had died of childbed fever. So he thought, oh gosh, so not only women are dying of this fever, this physician who conducted this autopsy was also dying. And he thought, then this is again before we know about germs and microbes and all these sort of things, he thought that there were particles that um, were in these cadavers that were being um, carried by the physicians and then you know, either ingested or somehow they were infecting, infected that physician and maybe this contamination of the physicians doing these autopsies was accounting for then passing on these parti particles, he called them, to the mothers in the wards um, that they were manning. And so he said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have the physicians make sure that they wash thoroughly with chlorine bleach, basically. And you can see the data here. Um, after he implemented his hand washing protocol with the chlorine, that he got great results. So this is the, the deaths in the mid, midwife ward, and these are the deaths that went down after the hand washing intervention on the physician's ward. Um, and so, this is amazing, right? So in the absence of really an accurate germ theory, kind of figured out that really we just need to wash hands. Um, but the sad story uh, when it comes to implementation science is that this practice of hand washing was not sustained in um, Semmelweis's hospital and why was that? And in fact, he was fired. And um, he really fell from grace so what happened here? Okay, so the physicians did not like this hypothesis, right? The physicians felt like now, you know, they were being blamed for the death of these women. Um, he was not a very diplomatic person. Um, and so when he was describing this, if people disagreed with his hypothesis, he got really angry. So he got, he got into conflicts with people in authority in the hospital and was summarily dismissed. He went on to try to disseminate his, um, his, this hand-washing intervention and his theory to other um, uh, medical centers in Europe. He was also dismissed. Um, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a sad story. Okay, so then <laughs> he got angrier and more despondent over time. He was ultimately uh, placed in an asylum where it's, the theory is that he was beaten and contracted a septic infection and died. So basically died of a very similar infection to the one he actually developed an intervention to reduce. So this is, the implementation scientists look at this case study and they're like, okay, so we had an, a, a, an in a treatment innovation, we had some really good local data that it would work and it was not used ultimately for many reasons, right? So organizational reasons, interpersonal reasons, people were resistant to change, being asked to do something outside the routine practice and asked to do something that was kind of offensive to them, you know, that they were to blame for something so terrible. So super depressing story, right? Okay, so this is why we need implementation science, okay? Um, and you might, okay, so we all know now, we have germ theory, right? It's a very simple intervention to decontaminate hands, it's hand washing, and you don't even, we know now you don't even have to use something as sort of corrosive as chlorine, right? You can just use soap and water, okay? 
Um, and the World Health Organization has a really nice way of implementing this. There are like five moments, my five moments for hand washing that have to do with, you know, before you come into contact with the patients, um, before you do any aseptic tasks or any task where you'll be touching someone's mucous membrane, you wash your hands. Um, Any time after you, you've come into contact with the bodily fluid, after patient contact, and then before you leave to go home after you've been in patient surroundings. So great, we have these guidelines. Everybody knows you should wash your hands to reduce contamination. Is this successful? Has, has this been a successful implementation? People are like, yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay, so <laughs> um, here is some data from an unnamed hospital. Um, and <laughs> this is just example compliance rates for these four, um, these four of these moments for hand washing. So people are pretty good after they've touched something yucky. They're pretty good at washing their hands. But these other times, you know, not, not really so much. So again, implementation is about like how can we move these compliance rates? What are all the routines and care settings? What are the attitudes? What are the organizational management people doing to try to move these compliance rates to adopt and sustain evidence-based practice? So let's um, switch back to mental health and switch back to mental health treatments. And so we just talked about a nice, really simple, wash your hands, it's a very simple intervention. You know, one, maybe two steps, okay? Mental health treatment, it's not a simple intervention, right? So when we're talking about treating children who have anxiety disorders or depression or disruptive behavior problems, we're talking about complex, multi-component, multi-step, behavioral interventions that require a lot of training of mental health professionals to do well and with integrity. Um, so there's, we know that there's big, there's this, we've got all these 600 treatment protocols, we know they're really complex and we know it's hard to change people's routine practice and get those things into routine care. So um, if we know that rates of compliance with hand washing are low, um, if it's not enough just to transfer knowledge from all these treatments and say, hey, I've got this great treatment, I've shown that it reduces children's obsessive compulsive disorder symptoms, just use this with your OCD patients. Um, there's a big gulf between having developed that and having people um, use it in the community to, to help children. Another kind of well-known finding in implementation science is what we call voltage drop. And this means that the effects that we've observed in those randomized controlled trials that showed my OCD treatment to be effective in my university clinic, got great effects, large effects. When someone, when they are transported into a community setting, okay, so not a university clinic staffed with doctoral level um, therapists, but now we're talking about maybe moving into a, a publicly funded community mental health agency staffed by uh, master's level clinicians who have 26 families on their caseload, all with different kinds of mental health problems and they're expected to meet all their needs. When we bring these research-based treatments with good effects into these community settings, where people have less support to learn these complicated practices, where they have so many other demands on their time and attention, we don't get the same effect sizes we observed in the clinical trials, right? So, um, and many studies have shown when we do our best, when we bring these um, treatments into community settings, we train up the community therapists, we even give them ongoing supervision for maybe six months to make sure that they understand and are able to do the practice. We don't, uh, we sometimes don't see that the intervention outperforms the routine care that they were already giving. So that is voltage drop. So why is voltage drop happening? Okay, so there's kind of two clusters of categories of reasons that people think um, might contribute to this. One is um, what we just talked about, right? Lale talked about this that these treatments have been designed in these university clinics with pretty homogeneous samples of educated, middle-class families, 
Oftentimes, they're European American or white families, and they're presenting at university treatment centers. Okay? Um, they weren't designed in these community settings with low-income families, um, you know, who are on uh, Medicaid funding, this sort of thing. So that's a big difference. So do these EBPs that we've created fit across and generalize across different populations? And another thing that can happen, remember I talked about these usual care, routine care contexts where these therapists are under multiple pressures for productivity, they have high case loads, low levels of supervision and support, and very different background training uh, than we see um, the clinicians in university settings. So there's, what about the integrity of those interventions? When you ask someone to take on learning this, you know, very structured protocol, um, not designed necessarily for their settings, and they're meant to do them, and they're already very high demand, high stress jobs, we might anticipate that the integrity or fidelity with which those treatments are uh, given, that that's really degraded. And these things can be related to each other, right? So if you're trying to fit a treatment that wasn't necessarily you know, developed for your low-income Latinx family, maybe it's gonna be really hard to stick to the structure and the details of that protocol. <laughs> so this is the question, this uh, leads us to the question of who is our evidence based for? Who is it based on? And this gets to, again, Lale's point about who is in this evidence base. So here is a, gr uh, a graph from, uh, this is data from randomized controlled trials for treatments of depression uh, from 1981. Um, all the way through 2016, and this was a study done by another colleague of mine, Antonio Polo, and his students at DePaul University, and it's very simple. He's just graphing over time uh, the percentage of the samples in these randomized controlled trials uh, of treatments for depression by race ethnicity. So um, one kind of bit of good news is this, this pinkish line that's going down over time is this is the, the, rate, the proportion of the samples for whom race ethnicity was not reported. So it used to be back in the day, we didn't even say who was in these studies. Um, now we at least report the race ethnicity, so that's gone down. Um, this line over here, so even though the proportion of American adults with depression um, has probably gotten more racial ethnically diverse over time, um, the representation of white participants in these trials has only gone up, okay, between 1981 and 2016. And then down here are the lines for, you know, our major racial ethnic minority groups. Um, African Americans are here in the red line, Latin X, we've made some progress and more inclusion, but it's still way down here, well below their um, representation of the population. And this line here, this blue line here, Asian Americans, and then we've got Native American, a Native Pacific Islander, uh, Pacific Islander down, uh, really not coming up above zero. So um, our evidence base is pretty homogeneous for treatments of depression, and it's probably better for depression than any other mental health condition. So that's who's represented in the research base. Um, and, you know, myself and uh, uh, Professor Weechen Huang right here at CMC, we've really been interested in particular in focusing on what is the evidence base for Asian Americans. And this is a study that just came out in JAMA um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it really documented how much of our federally funded research has been devoted to any clinical care practice with Asian American populations, and it turns out it's 0.17% of the overall NIH clinical budget. Um, and is it getting better over time? Not really. <laughs> Prior to 2000, it was 0.12, and after the year 2000, it's been about 0.18%. Um, so it's not that good <laughs> for some of the communities that you know, I've been most invested in trying to understand the fit for these uh, interventions. So people can talk about the relevance or irrelevance of the evidence base for our routine practice settings, okay? So um, there's been data showing that only about 4.5% of randomized controlled trials are treating patients that have actually been referred to routine care settings. Oftentimes, who's in these RCTs or a researcher goes out and tries to find people with depression, 
to enroll them in their study. So they're not actually people who, who are presenting to their physician or care environment. So they're kind of recruited samples, and they're, they're going to be different from people who are going to be showing up in our care settings across the country. We have data showing that these evidence-based practices are not going to fare as well with complex cases, people with severe forms of illness, or people with multiple comorbid mental health disorders. And this is actually most people with a mental health condition have more than one. So depression with anxiety, for example. So we know most about treating pure depression of recruited samples. And we know that if we compare controlled trials, like I showed you, with the routine care settings, um, really racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and linguistic diversity is much greater in practice settings. And the implementation conditions that mental health providers are working within are really different in university research clinics versus community care. So what does this mean about what we can take away from the state of science on evidence-based practice for ethnic minorities? Um, we have some choices here, right? So we can say, oh, the evidence isn't really good for my diverse population that I'm interested in treating. So I can just say, to heck with it. We're just going to get rid of these and start from scratch. We're, we're going to ignore. Uh, we're going to discard the evidence-based treatments and, and try something that we think is going to work based on our clinical acumen, our clinical experience with the population, because I'm an expert in this population. Okay. We could ignore the fact that our evidence base doesn't match up with the community, um, the communities we're trying to treat, or we can try to adapt or modify these interventions. Uh, to make sure that they, you know, they fit better, okay? And so, you know, people, people take different approaches here. And I'll say that sometimes when I do go into a community practice setting where they have a wealth of clinical wisdom and experience with their populations, they say this to me, like, why should I use your treatment when you haven't shown me that this is going to work for my families. I know my families, okay? Um, and then you have, um, oh, so that's maybe the discard. That's the discard people. Then you have the people that are like, we have full confidence in science. Science is the way forward. <laughs> We're just going to go with what we know and don't tinker around with these evidence-based practices because you might, you know, you might change things in a way that reduces fidelity and integrity and it's just going to be a whole wasted effort. Okay? And then you have people who are sort of in the middle who don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, who want to use some strategies to adapt in an informed way uh, to make them improve the fit. And um, that's certainly where there's been some effort and growing interest over time. If I do my very scientific Google Scholar search over time. People have started to talk about this. Uh, notion of cultural adaptation of mental health treatments. Um, and so this has been a burgeoning area, and we, Chin and I, both kind of started doing this work around this far, right? Um, and in so doing, in talking about how do you culturally adapt these interventions for diverse populations, people have some worries about this, right? So some people say, if you haven't done a study where you've shown that Asian American families don't benefit from this treatment as much as white families, then you don't adapt it. Just do it straight. Do it with fidelity. So if there's limited evidence that there's actually disparities, don't tinker. Okay? Because if you start tinkering around in an unscientific way, you are going to degrade those effects like we see in the voltage drop scenario. And furthermore, we can't go around creating a special treatment for every single group there is, right? This is going to be inefficient, and they're just going to be multiplicative, and, and then that's going to be unmanageable. I'm going to have like a variant of every single treatment for every single problem for every different community that's not tenable. Okay, but what, what about when it is appropriate? What do people say about when it is appropriate to adapt? There's a reasonable risk that the effects won't generalize, okay? So, Maybe we have some small studies that show different effects. This is more often the case. People don't like the treatment, they don't come to the treatment, or they drop out of the treatment. Um, or if we know from some more basic science that the risk factors for, say, depression in your ethnic community are different, 
They maybe have to do with historical trauma for Native American groups. They maybe have to do with experiences of racial ethnic discrimination for racial ethnic minority groups. If we know that the risk factors for that target problem are different, maybe our treatments should attend to those. So I've been, um, one of the first thing I was interested in was a set of interventions for children with disruptive behavior conduct problems called parent training. It's such a terrible word for a treatment. I'm going to train you as a parent. Um, but, but this is, uh, these are sort of a cluster of interventions that teach parenting skills which are basically drawn from you know, what we know about behavior modification, so principles of reinforcement, okay? So we talk about things like praising and giving rewards for good behavior. We talk about um, uh, making clear expectations and routines for children to know how they're meant to um, comply with instructions. Then we talk about reducing attention for unwanted, undesired behavior, so uh, ignoring misbehavior, um, using timeout, so removing attention from a child who's uh, having a tantrum until they stop tantruming and then returning your attention. So um, parent training, you know, has a real wealth of evidence behind it as reducing behavior problems, okay? So, and the way it works is, you know, you, the therapist meets regularly with the family, doing a lot of teaching of parenting skills to these parents, having them practice, um, and then, you know, and then between sessions, the practice, the parents are meant to practice these skills at home and then report back on how they're working. So this is parent training. And what we know from parent training is we do have some um, significant evidence that ethnic minority parents are more likely to drop out, less likely to come when it's uh, being offered. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence because, again, the evidence base isn't that diverse. We don't have a lot of evidence that it works less well for different racial ethnic minority groups. Um, and we don't have a lot of evidence for um, why some people don't, some ethnic minority groups don't respond well to parent training. So, um, I think we covered this. So when I started approaching this problem, how are we gonna adapt in a systematic way parent training for, in my case, immigrant Chinese families, I thought, okay, well we know people aren't coming, we know that um, maybe parenting is such a culturally embedded practice, people do it so differently across different cultural communities that trying to teach a parent who never grew up being praised is gonna be a tough sell as compared to middle class European American families that are pretty comfortable with the notion that you're gonna um, give some positive remarks and express appreciation for positive behavior. Um, so, you might, these, these skills are not culturally native, they may not be that acceptable, you're gonna have to address maybe these problems with engagement. And then again, for behavior problems, say in immigrant families, um, we know that behavior problems arise in the context of you know, different kinds of family processes in immigrant families. Um, and when we talk about immigrant families, we often talk about this acculturation gap between parents and children where, you know, um, say Asian American children, they really kind of adapt to that school peer environment, expect to relate to their parents in ways that they might see on TV, for example, you know, having, you know, back and forth conversations about whether or not they're allowed to do a certain privilege or not. And parents adapt much more slowly to norms around family communication and discipline. And so, you know, maybe we really need to address these risk factors that we, we know maybe relate to the development of children's behavior problems if they're having this cultural gap between them. And we might need to augment EBTs to add skills training to address these culturally relevant risk factors. So really called um, these two strategies engage and augment. And really affected, you know, by my personal upbringing, right? So when I was being trained as a student and thinking about, okay, I'm getting training and these parent training practices, in my head the whole time I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable, but God, can I imagine my parents who immigrated to Canada in the early 70s, what would they have thought if, you know, someone told them, well, here's your disruptive child, that's me. 
um, and you want to get her to stop doing whatever thing it is and take a picture like a normal child, um, you're going to use like wait until she's not being then when she's you know smiling appropriately like heap on a lot of praise. No, the, she, her you know the, they really had the ethos is you don't praise children for behaviors you just expect them to do, right? Okay, so you're not going to praise them to like sweep the floor and wash. That's just their responsibility. You don't praise them for that. And so, you know, when, when I was learning these practices and thinking about just from my own family experience, like, huh, how would that go over? That really started to help me think through what I thought was going on with these evidence-based practices in my family today. And of course, now that they're grandparenting, there's so much praise, okay? <laughs> so they're super into it now. So maybe it's generational, but um, yeah, so that's that. So, um, started to think about doing research that would help me design these adaptations. And so started really with high-risk immigrant uh, Chinese-American families um, and did some studies, really uh, interview and survey studies with high-risk families trying to figure out what was the context of punitive discipline or ineffective discipline in Chinese-American families and really found that in addition to, you know, all the other kinds of things, there were a number of things that seemed to be salient family context variables for why parents felt like they were having difficulty getting along with and disciplining their children. Um, one is uh, there was a very common narrative around children having academic problems or maybe not performing up to the children's standards and maybe engaging in some negative discipline around that. And I like to kind of remind people um, that, you know, oftentimes these parents, low-income parents, are really undertook this really stressful thing to immigrate um, to a country and leave all their social capital behind because they're after one thing, which is educational opportunity for their children. So why do they have these punitive reactions, these sort of desperate reactions? It's really about all their investments and their worries, right, about what's at stake if their children don't do well. So we knew we had to address that. And then these acculturation conflicts around um, parents really perceiving that their children's misbehavior or noncompliance really was about, you know, attributing it to the child being spoiled or having a bad character when, you know, really I think it a lot of times had to do with these two different cultural worldviews about what was appropriate ways of talking to each other um, and relating to each other. Um, and then the stressful context of being a low-income um, a parent uh, who maybe doesn't have very much job security, that is really trying to navigate a number of different stressors in kind of making it, um, making it in a new cultural context. We call, tend to call that acculturative stress. So we um, went about augmenting um, parent training with adding um, different interventions to promote communication, um, make, having parents make different attributions for why children were questioning, you know, their authority, that sort of thing. Having parents um, use cognitive strategy to sort of identify their upsetting thoughts about child behavior and modifying those, making different um, assumptions about their children's behavior, and then really supporting children's schooling. So as much as um, parents were really invested that their children do well, the data really show that they really actually have lower levels of involvement in their children's schoolwork um, than, than their expectations you would think in these immigrant families. And that's often because of language and literacy, right? And it's often because of the thoughts that the role of the student is to work hard in school and the parent is just to um, not necessarily be involved in that, that is a teacher's role. So we really um, gave parents, okay, even if you don't know the content in school, how do you show interest in what the child is learning? How do you structure and monitor that kids are doing their homework? So proactive strategies rather than reactive negative discipline. So treatment worked, so it was good. Uh, <laughs> um, but we, we, even in our data, we noticed that parents, the immigrant Chinese parents with the highest levels of parenting stress and acculturative stress did not respond as well to the intervention. Their children didn't respond as well. And then I think most importantly in this study, what we did was, this was studies, uh, this study, the trials were carried out in, a, in uh, community clinics with community, not university clinics, but uh, community clinicians in real routine practice settings. And we really asked them, um, what, what if anything was challenging for you in delivering this intervention? And, and the, the comments really converged. These are difficult 
skills for immigrant parents to learn. They're brand new. They've never heard of praise. They've never heard of time out. They needed extra practice, more support, and more like role play practice. And it was really difficult to have enough time to practice and practice and practice these skills that were brand new because we have to move on to the next topic. So um, that's what they were saying, which um, made me kind of reevaluate and say that the cultural experience differences, yes, they were about beliefs and values and things like about praise and how acceptable those interventions were. So we need to focus on framing these in ways that are consistent with parents' goals. Um, we, yes, we need to address the relevant risk and stress context and give parents additional skills that match their family um, needs. But also we need to think about these cultural differences in exposure as one about learning history, okay? So um, how fast are they gonna learn the skills if they've never ever praised anyone, okay? Um, we're gonna need to give them more practice and intensify that practice. So we kind of revised that model too, okay? Um, and so this is just one example of, you know, a really great body of research that lots of people have been doing about strategies to culturally adapt interventions. And what we know from a recent meta-analysis by Gordon Hall um, is that these culturally adapted evidence-based practices work really well. The effect size are large. Um, when you compare them against, like, no control or attention control, um, uh, they have really big effect sizes. And then even if you compare them to the standard, unadapted, the gold standard, you know, the generic intervention, they really do outperform um, the unadapted intervention. So people are doing these, these, this really careful work in culturally adapting interventions, including your own CMC professor, uh, Lee Chin Huang, who, who did one of the hardest studies. He did one of the hardest studies um, comparing an, a, a culturally adapted uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for adults with severe depression in routine practice settings. And he didn't just do a no treatment control like me, like a weightless control. He did it full on comparing it against the gold standard CBT protocol and found um, some really strong effects. This is really, really hard work. And what I want to just pause to say here is that representation matters, okay? So you, people do this research if they understand that this is a need in an underserved, understudied community. So what's going on here with who's in the studies and who's doing this work has a lot to do with who's in the room and who's in the table getting federal research funding and who's in academia and all this sort of thing. So it really takes great scholars doing careful work um, and that we really need to diversify the pipeline of people doing this work. Okay, so we know now stuff about these researcher designed adaptations. We know that it's not, you know, we're not tinkering these with these things in ways that they can't work. You know, you can modify them and preserve strong effects. We know that they're both effective and as well as incrementally effective over and above the standard treatments. And um, the, the part about this is that all those studies and that meta-analysis probably are gonna have all the same problems that that big pile of 600 books in my office is, right? So we're gonna do these nice studies of these carefully designed adaptations and then nobody's gonna use them, right? So these adaptations, these carefully studied ones are subject to the same um, practice to research challenges and that implementation cliff. So what we've started doing lately within this um, in space of implementation science is just asking, okay, if we can get these evidence-based practices into the hands of community providers, what happens? What do they do? How do they adapt or make them work with their very diverse um, clients? So when EBPs are implemented in community mental health settings, how do therapists, um, frontline therapists adapt them and how do the ways they adapt them align with what us fancy clinical researchers are doing um, and how does that affect the integrity or effectiveness of those interventions? And, you know, I think what some implementation researchers are really guilty of is uh, having sort of these attitudes about evidence-based practice and community therapists, like, oh, they don't care about science, they, why don't they just do what we tell them to do, this very sort of 
paternalistic model of knowledge transfer from science to practice, where in implementation science we're really trying to understand why aren't they doing <laughs> what, what, you've, um, what you're putting out there. Um, and maybe we should be paying attention to what they do um, when given the opportunity to do good, solid interventions. So um, this is the idea that ad adaptation is inevitable when we move um, interventions to new contexts. Again, this is David Chambers. And there's all sorts of reasons why people adapt EDPs um, uh, in terms of the service settings they're put into, who they're, who's delivering them, um, all sorts of reasons why. And David Chambers argues, and he uses, again, these really terrible words like positive deviance. Oh boy, people should really check their language. But um, he argues that we're going to observe this natural process. We should observe this natural process of adaptation and identify those types of adaptations that he calls positive deviance. So changing the practice in ways that promote good quality outcomes. And then we should uh, discriminate those from things that are pro program drift or getting us away from the integrity of the interventions. Um, so that's what we're doing now, and it's very exciting in California um, and in Los Angeles County because we've really had an opportunity to look at a big implementation effort in LA County. Uh, and just a short story of this is, um, if any of you are millionaires in the room, um, uh, you should be donating to CMC for this event. Uh, <laughs> but also, um, you are paying into um, a voter-approved ballot measure, Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act in California. And this is a 1% tax on marginal income over a million dollars that goes to fund innovative mental health services all around the state. And one of the things that the MHSA has funded is something called the Prevention and Early Intervention uh, Program in Los Angeles County, which, guess what it did? It, it created a special funding stream for community clinics and therapists to get a special pot of money reimbursed when they deliver evidence-based practices, okay? And this worked because it coincided with um, a state budget crisis. So actually, all the other money was gone, and the only other money that was available to fund a large proportion of children's mental health services was this PEI money. So it was sort of a de facto mandate. If you wanted to keep your, keep your clinic doors open, you had to learn and deliver these new EDPs. So a very stressful time in the context of the children's mental health system, but it was it sure made a difference in the delivery of EDPs. So this is a map of LA County. This is LA County over here which has a population greater than all these states in blue, okay? So huge, huge numbers of people um, who were now uh, potentially getting these uh, evidence-based treatments in the public mental health system. And look at the demographics. This blue slice of the ply are Latinx families and African-American, non-Hispanic white 13 and 3% AAPI. So this is interesting, right, because it doesn't look anything like the graph that I showed you before about who was in the evidence base. So what is going to happen when community therapists are picking up these interventions? So we're doing a study, now it's ongoing, it's called the Four Keeps Study, Knowledge, Knowledge Exchange on Evidence-Based Practice Sustainment. I carry this study out with my colleague at um, University of California, San Diego. Um, this study is looking at what has happened with the six of the biggest EDPs that were rolled out in this LA County implementation. So we're looking at community therapists implementing multiple evidence-based practices for kids. We want to know how they're adapting them and how that maps on to you know, what do researchers say about how to go about adapting things. So did their ad adaptations look like this, like what we are saying in the lab we should do? So uh, we conducted first a survey of about um, almost 900 therapists, and they told us about their delivery of these practices over the last couple months with an index patient. And we found that we could um, identify that many of them were augmenting, right? So adding things to modifying the presentation 
So this is like engaging them through using uh, you know, culturally responsive ways of explaining why to do praise, calling it things that were culturally acceptable, um, using um, cultural idioms, um, integrating supplemental context, so adding you know, uh, strategies to help parents manage their negative thoughts, right? Uh, cognitive strategies, teaching them better communication skills in, in the context of parent training. And lengthening and extending the paces, so slowing down. It's really hard for these families to learn how to praise effectively. They keep mixing it up. They'll say like, okay, so I did praise. I said, okay, good, that you, good for you, you did your homework. Then I said, why don't you all do your homework every time without me asking you? And so they're pairing praise with criticism, right? It's kind of spoiled it. So needing more practice, slowing down, breaking it down. And then the reducing adaptations would be things that we would think decrease maybe the effectiveness of the intervention. So reducing things or skipping things that maybe you think the family's not going to find acceptable or condensing it going faster and maybe not paying attention to how well they're learning. Uh, that's not how they would say it, but just cutting things out and going quicker um, or adjust adjusting the order of components. So we call these augmenting and reducing adaptations. And what we found uh, in community therapist reports was across most of the practices, they were reporting high levels of augmenting, in, uh, augmenting the uh, practices, kind of like we, we, we sort of saw in the evidence base about what sort of uh, uh, was leading to positive effects in cultural adaptation. And they were much less frequently reporting taking things out. Um, except for one practice that was sort of um, allowing some of those modifications. And then we, um, we noticed a few things. We noticed that the Latinx therapists, the Latinx community therapists, were doing many more augmenting, uh, augmenting adaptations, so modifying and tailoring that presentation, adding things that they thought were culturally responsive. Newer therapists were doing that too, investing a lot of time in trying to make and tailor those interventions. Reducing learning when people do things that could compromise the EBP when they didn't like it, when they thought it was stupid. Okay, so <laughs> they didn't think it was a good fit. They did more of these types of adaptations. Okay, and why? Why did they say they were adapting interventions? Um, actually, interestingly, they were citing cultural reasons only a, sm uh, a small proportion of the time. Um, and mostly when they said they were doing uh, adaptations, they were augmenting for cultural reasons. And reducing adaptations, they rarely did that for cultural reasons. So they weren't saying I'm skipping things because they're not acceptable culturally for families. Okay, so in, the, in this data that I'm gonna show you, this is data not just asking people in surveys, but um, we collected data on 680 sessions where therapists were delivering these evidence-based practices. And then we asked them, just tell me, how you modified this, this evidence-based practice, if at all, and then we coded what they said they did in that session. Um, and we found some new categories here. We found the modifying, int integrating, and extending, um, and those together are what we've been calling augmenting. And the most common thing was modifying the presentation, so explaining this in a culturally relevant way, increasing the acceptability, adding new stuff, and slowing down. Uh, reducing happened only in about one in five sessions when they said that they were adapting. And this new thing, generalizing. So I'm using this practice in a new setting or with a new problem. But we really wanted to know what are the implications of therapists doing these things? Did they uh, go along hand in hand with really good delivery of the EBP? Or did they water down and make uh, the practice less robust or less, have less integrity? And so we found two types of adaptations related to um, high quality EBP integrity. And this is through our observing the whole session and coding how well they did the practice, the practices. And we found good news for modifying. So those therapists who were taking the time to um, describe why to do these skills in a culturally responsive way, explaining in language using kind of you know, metaphors and uh, examples that were really salient to ethnic minority families. That was associated with really good EBP integrity. So that's good news. And then the only other one that was related 
was extending. So this is when therapists said, like, I'm repeating things because they're having a hard time learning it, or I'm spending longer to teach, say, relaxation practices. Um, and that was associated with the lower overall extensiveness of delivery of the evidence-based practice, which was not what we expected, because we actually, in the research studies, say this is something you should do. You should slow down, make sure you practice and practice. So we looked at what people were saying they were doing and why. So this is modifying presentation. These are therapists who said they're really adding things. So I used a board game, Candyland, to practice I statements. Each color was assigned a feeling state, and we took turns. I modeled I statements on his turn. I coached him after he shared an I statement. So this is really incorporating play. This is someone incorporating art, and this is someone uh, using video to understand a concept. So when we modify presentation, it can be for cultural reasons. It can be just really to illustrate and bring home a principle. But you can see it takes a lot of work, it takes some creativity, and it really takes someone doubling down on investing in delivering the practice in a way that's going to feel relevant to the patient. Um, what did they say when they were extending? This client takes a lot of time to enga engage in creating her trauma narrative, especially doing her own art or drawing since she's so young, so it's going to take longer for her to complete it. I had to go over skills many times, model and work on focusing the client, and they still appeared confused and disinterested. And here I spent more time on cognitive practice due to their young age and difficulty grasping content. So, what we're taking away from this is these types of adaptations are getting pulled in different scenarios. Um, and when people say they have to slow down, it's often really some kind of learning barrier. They're having a really hard time imparting things, so they think they're slowing down. But in fact, in the end, they're just talking a lot. <laughs> and they're not like doing the practice. And that's what we found when we reviewed those, those recordings. So the take home here is what are we learning from therapists in the community? What is the practice-based evidence here? Um, so we think that there's a lot of wisdom. Um, and community therapists are making quite similar adaptations to EDPs as clinical researchers. They're reporting much more augmenting than reducing. And they're uh, addressing um, cultural factors by augmenting or adding to, tailoring the presentation. Um, and then what, when it comes to what's making practice better, that investing that time in modifying how you present and frame and explain things and teach things was associated with really good evidence-based care. But it's these instances where therapists are saying, hey, I have to slow down, I have to repeat myself, that actually care didn't look as good. So this is kind of different than what we're trying to do in these clinical trials when we adapt to add more practice, slow down. And what this tells us is that therapists really need more support in responding to clients who seem to have difficulty learning the skills. So it's not so much that they're saying, no, I don't want to do that, it's not acceptable to me, it's more that they're just having a really hard time grasping. And um, uh, what we want to be able to do is support therapists in leaning into the evidence-based practice rather than away from actively teaching the skills. And so this is a future direction for us is we're trying to add on to training and consultation support for therapists who tell us, my client's just not getting it, my client's just, just not getting it, and they're the ones who seem like they need the most, the most help. Um, these culturally competent therapists that we have, primarily Latinx, Asian American, African American uh, therapists, it comes pretty naturally to them to explain, um, situate the skills in ways that are acceptable and engaging. What's harder is these learning barriers that they're encountering and they're kind of stuck. It's kind of like a classroom teacher, right, when they're having a child with a different learning need. That's a really big challenge and we see that too in community mental health. So I, don't, I hope I didn't talk too long. I just want to end by saying um, I just want to shout out and admire our, all the hardworking community therapists across LA County um, doing this really big undertaking. It was really stressful. They had training rooms full of like 600, 700 therapists trying to learn a complex intervention in a short period of time and to see what they've done to make these interventions their own and to reach these families, uh, these diverse families. It's been really inspiring. So I'll stop there and just um, thank all my collaborators and the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, our funders at NIMH, and thank you.
Now we will have some time for questions. Please raise your hand and Sabrina and I will come to you. Please do stand up when you ask a question and try to keep your remarks reasonably short. Priority will go to students. Hi, thank you Hi. for your talk. Um, so I have a question sort of going back to what you mentioned at the beginning, talking about the weird samples. I know yeah. that a lot of these studies are conducted um, in universities with these specific samples, but specifically in American universities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering whether there is an international body of work, body of literature surrounding these EBPs and mental health. And if there is, how you see the interaction between that and the work that you do, especially considering your, considering your focus on these racial and ethnic minorities. That's a great, such a great question. And there is an international literature, and some of the barriers are that sometimes that's not English language literature. It's a little hard to find. So particularly in China, there's a real uh, growth in uh, mental health treatment, in psychological science in general. It's hard to access that literature if you're not a native. Um, but the, I do think that that work is informative, very informative. So there were some trials of parent training, for example, in, in Hong Kong with Chinese families in Hong Kong. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think there's some positionality when international researchers deliver an evidence-based intervention in other countries. Sometimes they're reluctant to adapt um, and they're more concerned with, you know, kind of credit, credibility and um, fidelity to the model. So there haven't been a lot of international studies with major adaptations. They tend to deliver the original treatment and see if it works in the same way. And we do know that it tend, they tend to work, um, even without it being adapted. And the question would be then, you know, is there more that you can do in those international studies to make them work? But um, right now, there's a really big movement in global mental health to move evidence-based practices to low uh, and middle-income countries. And that work is fascinating um, because they're doing what they can to bring these interventions to populations with no mental health infrastructure delivered by lay people in village communities. Um, and uh, um, I think simplified, simplifying the language, so you're taking away the jargon and you're delivering to uh, families that have no literacy. And it's that work is fascinating and inspiring and I think we can learn a lot from it because sometimes our interventions don't have to be as complicated as they are and we can kind of get things down to the core, simplify further and I think we're learning a lot of that from global mental health actually. Um, and then if we think about it, there's many places in North America that don't have good mental health services. You know, rural areas, um, just underfunded places, and people are thinking about, can we actually take these simplified versions of trauma-focused TFCBT that have been used in Uganda, delivered by village women, and, and, and do that in, um, you know, rural uh, Saskatchewan? with Native American population. So that work is really exciting to see the global implementation work coming back domestically. Yeah, good question. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering how you decided that this is what you wanted to do when you were an undergrad. When I was an undergrad, yeah. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I, I was an none undergrad. None of us do. So. <laughs> um, so I knew a few things. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I did start getting interested in this question of whether the psychology I was reading was generalizable or helped explain the experience of culturally diverse populations. So I was really interested in some really early work by Lawrence Col Kohlberg on moral development of children and he did some really interesting cross-cultural research um, back in the day and Carol Gill Gilligan did this with girls and boys and we had some really nice classic examples of our psychological theories not transcending uh, culture and space and time so I kind of knew I was interested in that um, and I think that was enough to get me kind of going um, in understanding kind of the impact of cultural diversity on a range of things and ultimately treatment. 
Hi, uh, my name is Susanna Thomas. Um, I was wondering, uh, I noticed that in all of your studies you were primarily focusing on racial demographic groups, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you had any research coming up that looked at different demographic groups like sexual orientation or gender, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, great question. Um, my own research uh, is, some of my treatment research, which I didn't talk about today, is focused on school-based care. Um, and really interested in um, suicide prevention work in high schools. And so in that work, it's challenging because we're trying to deliver intervention school-wide, identify kids who benefit from the most. And we know that LGBTQ um, youth are at very, very high rates of suicidal ideation and attempt. So we're trying in that work to incorporate attention to sexual minority identities as well as um, divergent gender identities. And sometimes that's just, it's enough to just bring it up um, and to use inclusive language um, to, to bring, so to use a, a standard mindfulness intervention, but you know, just signaling in our language um, that w we wanna hear, you know, we wanna hear um, your voice, we want to attend to this area of potential stress. Um, I think I would approach it differently if I was in a setting where I knew who the LGBTQ youth were and I was targeting an intervention, I would probably take a much sort of stronger adaptation approach, but in a context where there are going to be lots of kids with different identities, I think just that uh, making sure that everything you do as inclusive language as possible. Um, examples, there's examples in all our protocols. So when we talk about like, you know, John and Mary, and we have an example of how they're coping with some stressor, we really wanna make sure that we have examples where we're actually explicitly talking about kids with you know, identity concerns who use they pronouns, et cetera. So I would call that modifying presentation. So you're not changing the context, you're just making the language and examples more inclusive and personally relevant. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lily. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. Um, I think you might have touched on this a little bit. What? Oh, should I have this hand up? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you might have touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering, um, how do I say this? If the like race or ethnicity of the therapist as compared to their mm -hmm. client yeah. had any effect on the efficacy of the treatment or like of modifying the treatment and yeah. just like in general what research there is on that, especially if you're like a therapist yeah. in an area where like it's not, uh, where, where like most of your clients are not from your culture or heritage. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's such, a, such an important and good question. And it's a question of is it really who delivers it or is it really what you deliver? Um, and I don't think we have, you know, conclusive data on that. I certainly think that you don't have to have an ethnic or cultural match between provider and clinician to obtain a good result. I certainly don't think that is the case. But, you know, is it more of a downhill um, path for you if, if you are, you know, uh, share, if you share a home culture? Um, maybe so. And so our data from this For Keeps study speaks to that a little bit. So we're really talking about uh, a popul uh, the, the client population is about 70% Latinx um, receiving, the, the families receiving the care. And we, in our samples, we have about 55% Latinx therapists. And then we have other pairings. Um, and what we've found when we ask therapists about things like, in this session, um, we ask about barriers to engagement. So we ask, you know, did the, did the client express any reservations about the skills you were teaching or the treatment you were presenting? We ask about how actively did the client participate? And usually we're talking about caregivers with, with kids. And we know that Latinx therapists are saying, oh, there weren't any barriers. And no, they, they liked it. They thought it was great. They didn't have any trouble with it. 
Um, whereas non-ethically matched um, white um, therapists reported encountering more of these barriers. Um, and also we know that the Latinx therapists reported higher levels of these augmenting adaptations, um, modifying the presentation of the, of the intervention. Um, so yes, I think that there's some ease in, in that in sharing a culture, but I think it really is about um, if you're encountering those barriers, what are you doing? And are you, how well supported are you in bridging that divide if there is one? So um, I think we have a lot left to learn about that, um, but it's a really good question. And um, yeah, I like to think of it as a, is it a who or is it a what? And I think it's both. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Please join me in thanking Professor Lab for her talk. Thank you. <laughs>